Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are, and we thank you so much for your goodness to us, for your love for us that surpasses our understanding. And Lord, I thank you for our church family. I thank you, Lord, that we get to visit with each other at least once a week. I, Lord, I thank you uh, for even these seasons within the summertime when people come back for a break, and so we get to, to visit with them. And Lord, we look forward to the fall when most of our people will be under one roof again. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, help us all to take more joy in our church family. We thank you for it. It is a gift from you. It is a blessing to each of us. And so, Lord, we're thankful for this time and the opportunity we have to study your scriptures together, to learn together, to grow together, to live life together. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. May this time be honoring to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'll start with a little bit of a personal story. You might even have heard it before. But like countless other people, I grew up in a broken home. My parents divorced when I was five years old and when my little brother was three years old. Um, and so because of that, my mother was a working single mother, which means that she did her best to be there. But the truth of the matter is she wasn't always able to be there. And so I assumed much of the responsibility of raising both myself and my brother as well. My visits with my father when I was really young started off weekly and yet quickly became more periodical as he moved farther away from where we lived at the time. Various family members, including my aunt, my grandparents, and a couple others, they did their best to fill in the gap um, and to kind of fill in some of those parental responsibilities, those parental duties, and to varied levels of success. So why do I mention all this? Because when I became a Christian at 16 years of age, I didn't just receive salvation. I didn't just receive a new relationship with God. And all of that would have been enough. All of that would, is, a, is a tremendous, insurmountable blessing in and of itself. But I also received the gift of a new family. All of a sudden, there were more people who loved me. More people who spoke into my life. More people who held me accountable to living for God, who encouraged me, who rebuked me when I needed it. And believe me, I needed it. People who taught me things that I didn't have the opportunity to learn because I didn't grow up in your normal nuclear family. And the list of blessings that I received from my church family goes on and on and on. In fact, leaving my church family to go off to college was rather scary because I was afraid that the family that I experienced at church was unique. And so because of that, if I left and went off to college and then off into the world, I would never experience it again. That was my fear. And yet, to my wonderful surprise, I did experience it over and over again throughout adulthood. I experienced it as I went from church family to church family over the years as we moved. In New York, at multiple different places as I moved around, I experienced church family. When Jenny and I moved to North Carolina and were part of a couple different congregations during our time there, I experienced the blessing of church family. When we moved down to Florida and moved to Port St. Lucie, we had a church that truly was family to us, and the same is now true with you all here in Belle Glade. So here's the question, Did I just, was I just fortunate? Was I lucky? Did I just happen upon the right churches where I could experience that type of family among the congregation? Or is it just that Christians tend to be nice, and so you're always going to just experience that? Or was it merely that my family growing up was so broken that I just absorb any remnant of family I can in any context I could find it? I don't think so. I think I've experienced this over, over and over again in different churches because this is how God intended the church to be. We have been talking through the series, The Church Is, and looking at different facets of that. And so today I want to encourage you by telling you that the church is a family. And I want us to understand that together today. Now, two weeks ago, as we began our sermon series, I said that the church is Christ's assembly. And that word assembly is right out of the biblical text. In fact, we see it all throughout the Old Testament and everywhere where you see church in the New Testament, that's that same word. So assembly is certainly a biblical word and a biblical concept. 
Last week, I said that the church is Christ's body. And again, that metaphor, in multiple places in the New Testament, we see the church is the body of Christ. Today, I'm going to use the word family to express several important relationship traits uh, that the scriptures clearly encourage us in our relationships with one another. First, let me be clear. The idea of the church as a family is definitely biblical. Uh, The scriptures use many familial terms uh, to express our relationship with each other and with Christ. Let me give you three of them. For example, Romans 12.10 says this. Love one another with brotherly affection. So as Paul is writing and he's trying to express the manner or the kind of love with which we have with one another, he refers to it in family terms. Brother or sister, sibling. We see in 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2, he describes it this way. He says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Now, Paul's giving an ethic for the church, how we are to treat one another. And yet, the way in which he describes this is in terms of family, because that is the best analogy to how we are to relate to one another. We, as the church, are a family. We see in the same letter, 1 Timothy, but chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The church is God's household, God's family. The church is a family. And many, many other passages as well refer to the church of Jesus Christ as a family. In fact, the most common term that's used, the most common metaphor, is that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And throughout the New Testament, there are instructions for how the church family is to relate with one another so that we can contribute to each other's discipleship and so that we can accomplish the mission that God has given us as his church. The church is a family. And so because the church is a family, there is a right way and a wrong way to engage with one another. As I alluded to last week, the Corinthian church engaged with each other in the wrong way on multiple points. In fact, at the very beginning of Paul's letter, we read this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 15. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one could say that you were baptized in my name. Now, this was no mere disagreement here in this church. This was a disagreement that led to dangerous and unwarranted division between the family of God at the church at Corinth. Now, I want to make sure we understand each other here. Paul was not afraid of disagreement. Uh, He was not against it in, you know, uh, disagreement in general. We read in Paul's letter to the Galatians that he even even challenged the apostle Peter, who walked with the Lord, when he was in the wrong. Paul had no problems with calling out bad theology, challenging bad practice, and debating with others who disagreed with him. Paul seemed to always be in disagreement. However, this is very different than what has unfolded here at the Church of Corinth, as we read in his letter. They allowed their affinity for particular church leaders to harden them against other church leaders and their brothers and sisters who followed behind them. And when they did this, they disregarded God's will for unity, even amidst disagreement within the church, to further their own causes. You know what it's called when we disregard God and his will in order to elevate our own 
desires, our own thoughts, our own self. It's called idolatry. And this is the issue that is underlying all of these things. As we consider our own day and the many issues on the table that face the church at large, uh, we have to be careful as well. Now, I wholeheartedly affirm that there are dangerous ideological, sociological, and theological threats facing the church that need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed head on. I agree that there are hard conversations that have to take place within individual churches, and in fact, even within whole denominations of Christians. However, we must be careful not to elevate our theological assertions above God and above his will for the church. We have to engage others in the church family with love and respect, striving for unity of mind and thought, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians. So we must learn how to have positive, constructive, respectful discourse with fellow Christians, whether we're in the church, whether we're out to lunch, or whether we're dialoguing with them or debating with them on Facebook even. Because the church is a family, and we cannot lose sight of that. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 says this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It is not an accident that Paul uses the word one so many times in this, in this passage. He is trying to make a point. We are one. Growing up with my brother, I already mentioned I had a little brother. Growing up with my brother, the same exact scenario happened over and over and over and over again. Here's what it looked like. Parents, raise your hand if you had more than one child. Okay, so many of you know exactly what I'm about to say. It goes a little something like this. My brother would instigate an argument. He would instigate a fight. I would react and end the fight. Then my mother would come home and I would be the one that gets into trouble. I'd often protest by saying, he started it. To which she would respond that regardless of what my brother did or didn't do, I was responsible for my own actions. And so Paul is saying the same thing in this passage. A Christian man or a woman in the church at Ephesus who would hear Paul's letter read aloud to the congregation, that person was under instruction to, according to our passage, live worthy of their calling. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Love other Christians. And make every effort to preserve unity and peace. But here's the question. This is the question I would ask. What if the brother or sister in Christ across the room didn't follow these instructions? Am I off the hook for that? Well, that didn't let you off the hook. Uh, this is what was expected of a member of God's family the church. In fact, Jesus himself said something along these lines. In John 13, 34 through 35, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So think about this. Why does the world look at the church as a bunch of hypocrites and see no reflection of the true Christ. And if you don't believe they look at us that way, just turn on the news for five seconds and then turn it off. You don't want any more than that. Um, at least one reason is this, that as the church at large, we do a poor job of loving one another. Now, it'd be easy for me to let us off the hook here, okay? It would be easy for me to let Belglade Alliance Church off the hook. After all, we are, and I'm being genuine here, we are a friendly lot. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I've experienced the love of the church family here in Bell Glade. Now, I have said that through many different churches, I experienced this. What I didn't say is there are some churches that Jenny and I were a part of where we did not experience that. Uh, we do experience that here at Bell Glade. 
I've consistently seen the kindness of our church members extended to each other, extended to visitors, even extended to the community. In fact, we start our Sunday school class every single week by praying not just for our members, but for people in our community because our people do care about others. We do a lot right when it comes to loving one another. However, as I mentioned last week, I also know of at least three family feuds that were entertained here at the church in the past six years. I've seen Facebook dialogues that have made me cringe. And I know that just like with any church, there's a lot that goes on that I'm not aware of. So friends, I don't say this in judgment, and I also don't say this so that you'll unfriend me on Facebook, please don't. Uh, Rather, just like the early churches that Paul wrote to, we need to be reminded that our goal among each other is is to sustain the family of God through love, respect, unity, and peace even while entertaining some important disagreements. The church is a family, and so because of that, there is a right way and there is a wrong way to engage with one another in the family. My second point is this. Because the church is a family, we need to invest in each other's discipleship. We need to invest in each other's discipleship. I want to take a step back and preface this. Uh, the church, we saw two weeks ago, the church is Christ's assembly because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And so Peter's confession that we saw in Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, that's the foundation on which Jesus builds the church. But make no mistake, it is Jesus who builds the church. The church we saw last week is Christ's body, because we've been baptized by one spirit to form one body in Christ. And so we all have our own roles. We are all specific parts of the one body. However, without Christ, there is no body. The church is the body of Christ. And so today we're looking at the church is also a family, but this isn't so by our work. Rather, it's yet another blessing of Christ's redemptive work. And so we've been formed by God in Jesus Christ as a family because of Christ. And he has also given us the ability to live together as family. He does it. And so we have the capacity. I know that there's times when you're in a church and there's somebody who's just a little harder to get along with than somebody else. And yet that's your brother or your sister in Christ. God has put them there. And God has given you the capacity to love them and them the capacity to love you. We imagine it. Where else in the world can people of such diverse backgrounds, different vocations, different ages, different economic classes, from all, you know, when you embrace the northerner, two northerners, uh, (laughs) you know, we are able to be family because of Christ. And so with that in mind, I want you to consider this passage from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so the author of Hebrews here begins rather extensively with what Christ has done for us. We have, these are just some of the things he mentioned. We now have the ability to enter God's presence with confidence. Now don't take this for granted. Don't miss this. This is in contrast with the innumerable times we see, even in the scriptures, that people approached God, but with fear and trembling. 
and yet we can approach him with confidence. There are also many times in Scripture where uh, people were too afraid to come into God's presence. God invited the, uh, the Hebrews at Sinai to come, and he's like, no, 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 no. Moses, you go for us. They were afraid of God's presence, and there were many others who weren't even permitted into God's presence. And yet we are invited to come and with confidence because of Christ. We now have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who mediates before the Father on our behalf. He is our advocate always before the throne of the Father. We can draw near to God. In fact, we're encouraged to do so here in this passage. We've been cleansed of guilt and we have been washed clean. We have hope given by one who the text says is faithful. Think about all these things. And what happens right after he gives this really long list? He says, in light of all of that, we are then given instructions on how we are to engage with one another in the church family. There's three things that he says. Here's the first one. We are to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We're to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Last week, I pointed out that we live in a culture that values autonomy. We value independence. We want to do our own thing. We want to be our own person. We don't like to ask for help. That's why the do-it-yourself section of the bookstore is just so big. However, I also pointed out last week that we need each other in order to fulfill our respective roles within the body of Christ. For many of us, we need our brothers and sisters in Christ just to identify our strengths, those, those spiritual gifts, those skills, those passions that would translate well to ministry in God's kingdom. We can't always identify them ourselves. We need our brothers and sisters to speak into our life, having identified those things and point them out to us. Then once we know what our strengths are, we need to be able to connect them to an area where we can minister effectively for God. And we don't always know what that looks like or where that is or how we can make a difference. But our brothers and sisters in Christ can speak into that process and help us to serve well. And the same is true in other aspects of the Christian life. We need our family members to help us. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We need the encouragement of our family. We need the wise counsel of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be held accountable to Christ and to his will for us. We need others in the church to collaborate with, to work alongside of, to mourn together in defeats, and to celebrate with us in victories. We need the church family. The second thing that this passage in Hebrews says is that we are to continue meeting together. Now, growing up in New York, I was fairly close to several family members from my mother's side of the family. I have several uncles, aunts, cousins that live all throughout New York, and we would often get together for all your special events, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for birthdays, for things like that. In fact, when a family member was passing by the town that we lived in, they would often stop off and make sure that we got to see one another. But then when our family moved away from New York, we realized some things. Sadly, I'm awful at picking up the phone and keeping in touch, and apparently so are my family members. In fact, I have uncles, aunts, and cousins that I haven't seen or spoken to in years. We have virtually no relationship at all. Now, no one planned it. No one party's at fault. Uh, we just didn't do what needed to be done to sustain the family relationships. We didn't own that responsibility to lean into family. So what are we, as a church family, doing or not doing to sustain the family relationships here in our church? Now, if you come to church once or twice a month, please understand, I'm so glad that you come. I do wish you'd come every week. If you do come practically every week, you're here almost every Sunday morning, that's great. I'd love to see you beyond just our Sunday morning service. So here's the thing, if we're going to live like family, the family that God intended us to be, then we do need to be a significant part of each other's lives, not just pay lip service to this idea of family. Let me ask you, how can you hold me accountable if you don't know how well or how poorly I'm living for God? 
How can I encourage you in the areas that God is calling you to if I have absolutely no idea how God is working in your life? How can you pray for me if you don't know what I'm going through? How can we learn from each other if we don't study the Bible together and dialogue with one another? It just can't happen. And the author of Hebrews makes it clear that even in his own day, first century, well, the scriptures are just being written just decades after Jesus died and rose again from the dead. They were already brothers and sisters who were wandering away from the church family and not meeting together. Friends, brothers and sisters, let's not do that. And the third thing our Hebrews passage says is this, that we are to encourage one another. In fact, it says we are to encourage one another all the more as the day approaches. What day is he talking about? The day of the Lord, the return of Christ, the end. And if you know me at all, you know that I'm not quick to proclaim the end is nigh. And yet, friends, we live in troubled and troubling times. And I'm sure, I really do hope that the end is near. I hope Jesus comes back really, really soon. Yet it's in difficult seasons especially that we need one another for encouragement, to press on in obedience to Christ in a world that is highly antagonistic toward us. Friends, and again, more rightly, brothers and sisters, we need each other as we grow in our discipleship, as we continue to move forward towards spiritual maturity, and as we continue on in our journey of sanctification that God is working in our lives. God has given each other, us to each other, so that we might grow together. The church is a family. My final point from our text or from our study today is this, that because the church is a family, we need to prepare each other for our mission. We need to prepare each other for our mission. Yes, we do have a responsibility right here to one another. We also have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters from other local churches. Because, you know, even though we, we tend to think in terms of our local church, our local family, uh, it's not this church and that church and that church. We are all the church. Different churches, but the same church. Different congregations, but the same family. We are all part of God's people. However, beyond even that, we do have a responsibility to the mission that Christ has given the church, the mission that is outside of the walls of the church beyond the current church family. So what mission am I talking about? Well, if you've been here for any length of time and know me at all, I hope you know what the mission is, but I'm going to remind you anyway from one of the key passages of Scripture. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20, uh, affectionately referred to as the Great Commission. And it says this, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, Jesus says. As the church, we own this. This is our mission. However, it's not only the pastor or the evangelist or the missionary who owns this. The entire church owns this mission. And it can only be accomplished as the whole church works together as a family at the family business. So what's the family business? Making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. So now that might look very different for each person who's a part of the church family. All of us individually might have different roles to play in that mission. For instance, one of you might be great at striking up gospel-centered conversations in your workplace with your coworkers. That's just your gift. That's how you were made. Another one might be able to contribute generously to world, to world missions. You're able to just give and you have a passion for giving that's, that's beyond those of those others of us in the church family. Another one might be sensing a distinct call from God to go serve as a missionary somewhere in the world. And still another one might be gifted at teaching new believers who come to faith in Jesus. And so all of us might have different roles within the family business. 
but we're all working together toward the same ends. For those of you who don't know, we have a family business in our home. Uh, Jenny owns and runs a printing company. And so at our home, uh, each person in the family has a different role. Uh, Jenny is a graphic artist, uh, and she has you know, built this company from scratch over the last several years. And often you'll find Jenny on any given day corresponding with customers or designing products or printing them on the printer. And then you'll find Jake usually peeling labels because she does mostly stickers. You'll find Josh punching tags. And so each person in the family is doing a different role, but we have the same goal. Uh, all of us are trying to get products out to customers uh, well. And here's the thing that we've learned, that as with any family, right, there are distractions. So if Josh's friend is available to play and Josh can't work, or uh, Jake's in the middle of a school assignment and so he's not available, all of a sudden progress is stopped up, right? Uh, we need to work together as a family because if one person isn't doing their role, then the end result is affected. And brothers and sisters, the church is a family and we are all responsible to the family business and it will take all of us working together to further the mission in our community and in our world. And if we're not doing our part, we are slowing the progress of the whole family. So friends, they will know that we are Christians by our love. The song says it, Jesus said it, John chapter 13. Let us remember that we are more than just people who share the same Savior and just happen to live in this community and this is the most convenient church. We're a family. Let's live like a family. Let's be intentional about that. Let's pull together like a family. Let's grab one another by the hand and pull each other forward in our journey with Christ as a family does. Let's promote each other's success and things that God has called us to. Let's partner together for the family business, the mission that Christ has given us. We are a family. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for each person here. I thank you for each one of our family members, family members, whether they're here with us today or not. And Lord, I just thank you for what they contribute, whether they know it or not, to the larger church family. Lord, I want to speak against anybody who is putting themselves down, who does not recognize the value that they have in contributing to the whole. Lord, I, I just ask that you would just speak to each person's heart and mind, revealing how you have uniquely made them and uniquely called them to contribute something that nobody else can to this church family. Lord, help us to learn new ways to bless one another, to receive blessing from one another, to build community here within our family, to collaborate with one another, to work together on projects, to be of one mind, to have unity, not just in, in agreement theologically and ideologically, but that we would also be committed, unified together in the mission that you've given us and how we are to execute it right here based on who you have brought together in this family. Lord, none of these things we could do apart from your grace and your leading. And so, Lord, would you lead this family because you are its head. Lord, we thank you for these things. And Lord, we just ask that you give us vision and just a passion for one another as we live out life as your church, as a family. In Jesus' name, amen.